Hello, welcome to today's webinar sponsored by the Fund for American Studies. And happy Groundhog Day. As Bill Murray said in the iconic movie, this is one time where television fails to capture the true excitement of a large squirrel predicting the weather. Now let's hope the uh, groundhog doesn't predict six more weeks of lockdowns and mandates. I am Steve Slattery, Executive Vice President at the Fund for American Studies, and I'm excited to be here today with Senator Rand Paul. For many years, Senator Paul has worked with TFAS to co-sponsor a summer lecture series on Capitol Hill to introduce interns to the ideas of individual liberty and civil society. Each summer, more than 1,000 interns attend these lectures. Today, Senator Paul will speak on the topic of capitalism, socialism, and the arguments for liberty. And he will take your questions at the end of the program. So please submit your questions via the Q&A function, and we will try to get all the questions we can in the re remaining time we have. Every day, Senator Paul is on the front lines of the fight for liberty, whether it's supporting a local restaurant that has been shut down by an overreaching city government, or challenging Dr. Fauci in a Senate hearing, or filibustering the Patriot Act. Since being elected to the Senate from Kentucky in 2010, Senator Paul has fought courageously and tirelessly to return government to its limited constitutional scope. Please welcome Senator Rand Paul. Thank you, Steve, and good morning, everybody. Uh, it's great to be with you this morning. Uh, it's sort of a little bit of a harried morning. We're in the middle of a three vote series on the floor, as well as a classified hearing uh, with the Secretary of Defense and the Secretary of State. And in the middle of all that, I'm trying to spend a few minutes with you guys. So we'll see how it works with the voting. But uh, to me, the argument is uh, a very important argument. It's sort of the, the basic argument of, of where you are and in the political spectrum and what you want government to do. People always say, you know, it's, it's an absolute or, you know, wh where you exactly want to be on the spectrum. But to me, it's where is government at this moment and where do you want it to go? Uh, do you want more freedom or less freedom, more regulation or less regulation? Do you think we're taxed enough already or do you think we need more in taxes? And really, it is ultimately that idea of which direction do you want government to go? There's obviously the perfection. The perfection to me would be almost no government, very, very little federal government, a constitutional government that uh, protects us. Uh, protects us from foreign invasion, protects us uh, in some ways from people who would uh, cause violence against other individuals, that the, there is a limited role for a national government. There's a little more of a role for a local government. And the one reason I think our founding fathers said the local government had more powers, even to have police powers, is that the government is closer to you. The smaller the division of government, the closer government is to the individual, the better chance you have of escaping that government. So if you want to live with the, the free spirits and the homeless of San Francisco, you can live there. But fortunately, you can move somewhere else, probably not in California, but you can move to another state. And that's what we're seeing is the freedom of movement now. You're seeing people moving away from California, moving away from Illinois, moving away from Pennsylvania, moving away from New York. They're moving from high tax states to low tax states. So the smaller the division of government and the less power that the federal government or even the state government has, the more power that devolves to actual lowest denominator of government, your local government, the better. I often will tell people when I am traveling around and I have county officials that really it would be better if the federal government would pattern our model of, of how we govern based on a local model. So when I'm in my county, Warren County, Kentucky, the judge executive there can only spend the money that comes in. He doesn't have a federal reserve. He doesn't have borrowing capacity or he has some. I mean, you can have school board issues and bond issues to borrow money for capital improvements. But for the most part, his daily expenses has to come in revenue and he has they have to make legislative decisions with the magistrates on what they're going to spend money on. It's sort of the opposite here in Washington. What you have is an infinite amount of money or to their thinking, it's infinite. Uh, without repercussions, and they just spend it on whatever. So there's never a debate over whether we need this project versus that project. There's never a discussion of whether or not, you know, spending a million and a half dollars studying whether or not if you take a selfie of yourself smiling, whether that, if you look at that picture, that selfie later on, whether that'll make you happy. No one ever debates whether that is an appropriate use of money because we just borrow it. But we're seeing the repercussions of that now. We're seeing the repercussions of inflation, the destruction of the currency. 
and uh, it's rapidly uh, come upon us. And it's important that people know and that people don't say, oh, it was COVID or it was this or it was that. It was the borrowing. Some of that's related to COVID, the spending and borrowing, but it's the Federal Reserve printing up new money, which devalue, devalues the current money and you can, you can buy less things with your money. It's important that we know this because if people have all these meandering sort of uh, inexplicable sort of, you know, what causes inflation if we only knew, we know what causes it. Debt financed by the Federal Reserve creating new currency creates inflation. But ultimately, it's a tax also. You know, Biden has said, we're not going to tax anybody under $400,000 a year. Well, guess what? Inflation is a tax. Right now, it's a general tax on all your groceries. It's a 45% tax on gasoline currently over the last year. So it's an enormous tax. And, and that tax is disproportionately borne by those who are of lower wages and those on fixed income. Now, everybody gets the same inflation, but the less money you make or the more your income is fixed, the more you feel it. So if you make $100,000 a year, the price of eggs isn't a big deal. If you make $20,000 a year or you live on Social Security, the price of eggs, milk, groceries, gas is important to you. And so this is the thing we have to call them out. But it's also that we have to call them out for something that is a bait and switch. This is something, and it's akin to socialism, but it, it's, the, it's the idea that there is something that you can get for nothing. And the, the libertarian response was always something called Tonstoffel. There's no such thing, right? No such thing as a free lunch. And that, that is true. You, you, somebody ultimately pays. And we need to convince people that, you know, what seems to be on the surface something good for people, giving poor people money, giving people checks. Everybody gets a $2,500 check. We're going to shut the economy down, but we're going to give you a check. People are like, well, yeah, I like that. And then other people say, well, why don't we make it universal basic income? Why don't we give everybody a $2,500 check every month? And so people have to understand that there are, rep there are repercussions to that. People have to understand that when someone offers you something for nothing, it is a bait and switch. It's a trick. They're, they're not telling you what the cost will be. And it, it's, a, it's a charlatanism of, of governing officials, people who run for office, uh, are offering you something for free, but not telling you that ultimately you will pay the penalty or that working class or people on pensions will disproportionately pay the penalty. But this is why our argument, the argument for freedom is more difficult. You know, we argue basically for something that's an abstraction. We argue for opportunity. What is opportunity? It's the opportunity to be free, to be left alone and to succeed, to excel in your religion or your beliefs or to excel economically is to be left alone, but it's opportunity. It isn't something we're going to give you. The other side would like to give you free college, free cars, free cell phones, free this, free that. But in reality, it's not free. It's that bait and switch. But you can see through electoral politics, through you know, the vagaries of democracy, you can see that it's hard. We're selling opportunity. People have to think in a second order. They can't just think of what they're immediately going to receive the check. And this infects both parties. Democrats are obviously worse at it, but even Republicans resort to this as well. During COVID, many of the Republicans acquiesced to the lockdown. They just said, oh, we have to do this. We're going to bend the curve. We're going to do all of this. I was opposed to all of it. I opposed all the programs because, as I, I said, I'm opposed to the lockdown. You wouldn't need all this excessive borrowing waste if you didn't have the lockdown. So from the very beginning, I said that none of it would work. And now as we look back on COVID, and hopefully people will honestly look back on it, we'll find that none of, the, none of the mitigations, none of the restrictions, none of the mandates worked. The only thing that ultimately slows the virus down that man is involved with is the vaccine. So the vaccine and natural immunity have slowed down the ability or the propensity for people to die or be hospitalized, both of them. And uh, they both work. In fact, the CDC doesn't like to admit this, but finally they did. They looked at a study of a million people. This was just a couple of weeks ago. A million people who had already had, uh, had, had the infection. They said, what is the, uh, well, not all of them had, had the infection. A million people who uh, came down with COVID, they said, how many of them were previously infected? How many of them have previously vaccinated? And then how many of them were unvaccinated? And they compared these three groups. And they did find this, and this is important for our side to acknowledge that if you are unvaccinated versus vaccinated, there's 20 times less likely chance of you going to the hospital. The vaccine does prevent um, a great deal of hospitalization and death. 
not no longer really preventing transmission, but it does it does serve to to aid in the health of preventing hospitalization and death. But the interesting part of the study was also they looked at people who were unvaccinated, but who had had the disease. That's me. I previously affected and I chose not to add the vaccine because I think my natural immunity is working. Well, finally, there's vindication. A study of a million people showed that people like myself who were unvaccinated but have had the disease are 55 times less likely to go to the hospital than those who are just simply unvaccinated. So it's not an argument for not being vaccinated, but it is an argument if you've already had the disease that you're fully protected. Why is this important? A lot of you on this webinar are young and being faced with college mandates. There's no reason for you to be forced into being vaccinated. One, it's an issue of freedom and choice, but two, particularly if you've gotten it, the vaccines may well be harmful to you. Particularly for young men, the evidence is in that a, particularly the age category 16 to 24, which would be later high school and, and all of college, that the more vaccines you give, the higher the increased risk of myocarditis and inflammation of the heart, particularly among males. This is uh, significant. All the studies are showing it. And yet the uh, CDC, Fauci, all the rest of them just say, do as you're told, get vaccinated. The colleges are mandating boosters. Even without a vaccine, if you're under 18, the chances of dying are about one in a million. So if you don't have other diseases or you're not significantly overweight, whether you get it or not, probably makes no difference. If you said, well, I wanna be a little safe or the recommendation might be to get vaccinated for me, one vaccine is probably more than enough. But what we do know is each time we give a vaccine, the increased risk for inflammation of the heart occurs. We also know that if you've already been infected and you get a vaccine, you will get a thousand times greater response than someone who hasn't been infected. Why? Because you're vaccinating somebody who already has immunity. It's also true that young people get a much more significant uh, immune response. So some of the thinking is, is that the over exuberance of the response from a young person plus a young person previously infected might be what puts them at risk. But from the government, we get nothing but mandates. Uh, they say you shouldn't uh, even think about what your risk is versus an older person. You should just do as you're told. That's the opposite of the way medicine is practiced. And it, medicine has always been individualized. So if someone came in to me, if you're 18 years old and you came in to me as a physician, I think it would be malpractice for me to treat you the same as an 80 year old because an 80 year old is about a thousand times greater chance of dying than an 18 year old. And so I think we should assess you based on your age, based on how much you weigh, based on whether you have other diseases before giving you advice. But I'd go one step further. I would ask you to have blood drawn to see if you've already had the disease. It's very easy to measure if you have antibodies to the disease. And if you've already had the disease, I would say, I think it's a danger to be vaccinated at all. Not only is it a danger, it's also duplicative. It just is of, of no value. And the vaccine might be better used by someone who's elderly. But uh, the problem is one size fits all is the way government looks at this. And it's the same sort of uh, mistake of central planning that we see with socialism. So if you have one person making all the decisions, like a Dr. Fauci, he's a great danger because when he makes a mistake, his danger is dispensed and promulgated throughout the entire society. That's the problem of socialism as well. If socialism sets the price of bread at 80 cents and the market would have set it at a dollar, you know, it's underpriced and all, all, all the bread will be gone. If the bread price is set at $2 and the market price were a dollar, the bread rots on its shelf and people go to a black market. So central planning doesn't work. It doesn't work for the economy or for medicine. And this is something we really need to understand. It's incredibly dangerous. If Dr. Fauci were a family doctor in Peoria, my goodness, we'd have so much less damage to the country because if you didn't like his prescriptions, you didn't like his pronouncements, you didn't like his opinions, you can go choose another doctor. But because he's the doctor in charge of everything, we have nonsense being pushed throughout the system. We have the CDC, we have schools, we have everybody doing things that make absolutely no sense and for which there is no science. We also have the profound... Um, audacity and gall of someone like Dr. Fauci who says that he is science and to criticize him is to criticize science. This is something that's very, very dangerous to get so much power into uh, the hands of one person, particularly a person as arrogant as Fauci and a person who has such a, a low regard for freedom. Ultimately, most things that uh, are good in our world and most of the successes of America have been related to 
basically being left alone, that government was instituted among men and women to protect our God-given liberties, but to do uh, you know, very little else. It wasn't to coddle us from cradle to grave. It wasn't to give us our neighbor's property. It wasn't to redistribute wealth. It was the idea that government was to be limited to preventing violence, both from foreign invaders, as well as those who might be violent among us, to administer justice through the judiciary system. The, the Constitution is pretty clear. Not much else was to go on. And then the 10th Amendment was a profound uh, directive that said, you know, those powers not enumerated, those powers not given to the federal government are left to the states and the people. And I think we'd also be better off, you know, if we were to devolve power in government um, and decentralize it. You know, my dad always used to say that liberty brings people together. Why? Because in a free society, I can have an opinion on COVID. You can disagree with it. If you want to wear a mask, that's your business. I'm also free to say they don't work, which they don't. But the thing is, is that liberty allows us to have different opinions. But we now have the new left, which I call the new authoritarian left, who doesn't really believe in, in sort of the idea that you can have opinions. They want to shut down Joe Rogan. They want to shut me down. They want to censor what we have to say because they've decided what the truth is. This is an incredibly dangerous concept. They also mistake the idea of free speech. It is true that the Constitution in the First Amendment restricts the government from uh, inhibiting your freedom of speech, but it also glorifies the idea of free speech. It, it, you know, the notion that people would say, well, the government doesn't restrict Twitter and uh, YouTube and all these people from censoring you. Well, that's true. But I think our founding fathers, the people who believed that freedom of speech and interaction was a basic human freedom would be appalled and would want nothing to do with private entities that restrict speech. Some conservatives say, oh, let's break them up. But what I say is quit using them, quit using their content, go somewhere else. And we have the power. We could bring Twitter down in a matter of days. If conservatives would quit using it, we'd bring it down. I've quit YouTube and ultimately I'm gonna quit the other platforms, but I also get some benefit from some of those in spreading the message. So I continue to use some, even though I complain but I'm not one who thinks that government should break up these entities. I'm one who believes, let's, let's, if you're mad enough, quit them. Don't use them. Don't use their services. Don't give them your money. Don't give them your content. Ultimately, when I look at our country, I think we have a country that's worth fighting for, worth saving. It's been described as a noble experiment, and it is, but it's something we need you. We need the next generation to fight for liberty also. It's, it's a battle worth having. I continue this fight, we'll continue this fight for a while longer, and I hope you'll join me in trying to defend our liberties. Thank you.